Chapter Three, Section Two B of Capital, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Jake Baker, September two thousand seven. Capital, a critical analysis of capitalist production. Volume One by Karl Marx, translated from the Third German Edition by Samuel Moore and Edward Aveling, and edited by Frederick Engels. Part One: Commodities and Money, Chapter Three: Money or the Circulation of Commodities, Section Two: The Medium of Circulation. B. The Currency of Money. There is a footnote on the word currency. Translator's note: This word is here used in its original signification of the course or track pursued by money as it changes from hand to hand, a course which essentially differs from circulation. End footnote: The change of form C to M to C, by which the circulation of the material products of labor is brought about. Requires that a given value in the shape of a commodity shall begin the process, and shall also in the shape of a commodity end it. The movement of the commodity is therefore a circuit. On the other hand, the form of this movement precludes a circuit from being made by the money. The result is not the return of the money, but its continued removal further and further away from its starting point. So long as the seller sticks fast to his money, which is the transformed shape of his commodity, that commodity is still in the first phase of its metamorphosis, and has completed only half its course. But so soon as he completes the process, so soon as he supplements his sale by a purchase, the money again leaves the hands of its possessor. It is true that if the weaver, after buying the Bible, sell more linen. Money comes back into his hands, but this return is not owing to the circulation of the first twenty yards of linen. That circulation resulted in the money getting into the hands of the seller of the Bible. The return of money into the hands of the weaver is brought about only by the renewal or repetition of the process of circulation with a fresh commodity, which renewed process ends with the same result as its predecessor did. Hence. The movement directly imparted to money by the circulation of commodities takes the form of a constant motion away from its starting point, of a course from the hands of one commodity owner into those of another. This course constitutes its currency, corps de la monnaie. The currency of money is the constant and monotonous repetition of the same process. The commodity is always in the hands of the seller. The money. As a means of purchase, always in the hands of the buyer, and money serves as a means of purchase by realizing the price of the commodity. This realization transfers the commodity from the seller to the buyer, and removes the money from the hand of the buyer into those of the seller, where it again goes through the same process with another commodity. That this one-sided character of the money's motion. Arises out of the two-sided character of the commodity's motion, is a circumstance that is veiled over. The very nature of the circulation of commodities begets the opposite appearance. The first metamorphosis of a commodity is visible not only in the money's movement, but also in that of the commodity itself. In the second metamorphosis, on the contrary. The movement appears to us as the movement of the money alone. In the first phase of its circulation, the commodity changes place of money. Thereupon, the commodity, under its aspect as a useful object, falls out of circulation into consumption. Footnote: Even when the commodity is sold over and over again, a phenomenon that at present has no existence for us, it falls. When definitely sold for the last time, out of the sphere of circulation into that of consumption, where it serves either as a means of subsistence or means of production. 
and footnote. In its stead, we have its value shape, the money. It then goes through the second phase of its circulation, not under its own natural shape, but under the shape of money. The continuity of the movement is therefore kept up by the money alone, and the same movement that as regards the commodity consists of two processes of an antithetical character is, when considered as the movement of the money, always one and the same process, a continued change of places with ever fresh commodities. Hence, the result brought about by the circulation of commodities, namely, the replacing of one commodity by another, takes the appearance of having been effected not by means of the change of form of the commodities, but rather by the money acting as a medium of circulation, by an action that circulates commodities, to all appearance motionless in themselves, and transfers them from hands in which they are non-use values to hands in which they are use values, and that in a direction constantly opposed to the direction of the money. The latter is continually withdrawing commodities from circulation and stepping into their places, and in this way continually moving further and further from its starting point. Hence, although the movement of the money is merely the expression of the circulation of commodities, yet the contrary appears to be the actual fact, and the circulation of commodities seems to be the result of the movement of the money. Footnote. Quote, it, money, has no other motion than that imparted to it by the products. End quote. Lotrasna, Loco Citato, page 885. End footnote. Again, money functions as a means of circulation only because in it the values of commodities have independent reality. Hence its movement, as the medium of circulation, is in fact merely the movement of commodities while changing their forms. This fact must therefore make itself plainly visible in the currency of money. Thus the linen, for instance, first of all changes its commodity form into its money form. The second term of its first metamorphosis, C to M, the money form, then becomes the first term of its final metamorphosis, M to C, its reconversion into the Bible. But each of these two changes of form is accomplished by an exchange between commodity and money, by their reciprocal displacement. The same pieces of coin come into the seller's hand as the alienated form of the commodity, and leave it as the absolutely alienable form of the commodity. They are displaced twice. The first metamorphosis of the linen puts these coins into the weaver's pocket. The second draws them out of it. The two inverse changes undergone by the same commodity are reflected in the displacement, twice repeated, but in opposite directions, of the same pieces of coin. If, on the contrary, only one phase of the metamorphosis is gone through, if there are only sales or only purchases, then a given piece of money changes its place only once. Its second change of place always expresses the second metamorphosis of the commodity, its reconversion from money. The frequent repetition of the displacement of the same coins reflects not only the series of metamorphoses that a single commodity has gone through, but also the intertwining of the innumerable metamorphoses in the world of commodities in general. It is a matter of course that all this is applicable to the simple circulation of commodities alone, the only form that we are now considering. Every commodity, when it first steps into circulation, and undergoes its first change of form, does so only to fall out of circulation again and to be replaced by other commodities. Money, on the contrary, as the medium of circulation, keeps continually within the sphere of circulation and moves about in it. The question therefore arises how much money the sphere constantly absorbs. In a given country there take place every day at the same time but in different localities numerous one-sided metamorphoses of commodities, or in other words, numerous sales and numerous purchases. The commodities are equated beforehand in imagination by their prices to definite quantities of money. 
and since, in the form of circulation now under consideration, money and commodities always come bodily face to face, one at the positive pole of purchase, the other at the negative pole of sale, it is clear that the amount of the means of circulation required is determined beforehand by the sum of the prices of all these commodities. As a matter of fact, the money in reality represents the quantity or sum of gold ideally expressed beforehand by the sum of the prices of the commodities. The equality of these two sums is therefore self-evident. We know, however, that the values of commodities remaining constant, their prices vary with the value of gold, the material of money, rising in proportion as it falls, and falling in proportion as it rises. Now if, in consequence of such a rise or fall in the value of gold, the sum of the prices of commodities fall or rise, the quantity of money and currency must fall or rise to the same extent. The change in the quantity of the circulating medium is, in this case, it is true, caused by the money itself, yet not in virtue of its function as a medium of circulation, but of its function as a measure of value. First, the price of commodities varies inversely as the value of the money, and then the quantity of the medium of circulation varies directly as the price of commodities. Exactly the same thing would happen if, for instance, instead of the value of gold falling, gold were replaced by silver as the measure of value, or if, instead of the value of silver rising, gold were to thrust silver out from being the measure of value. In the one case, more silver would be current than gold was before. In the other case, less gold would be current than silver was before. In each case, the value of the material of money, i.e., the value of the commodity that serves as the measure of value, would have undergone a change, and therefore so too would the prices of commodities which express their values in money, and so too would the quantity of money current whose function it is to realize those prices. We have already seen that the sphere of circulation has an opening through which gold, or the material of money generally, enters into it as a commodity with a given value. Hence, when money enters on its function as a measure of value, when it expresses prices, its value is already determined. If now its value fall, this fact is first evidenced by a change in the prices of those commodities that are directly bartered for the precious metals at the sources of their production. The greater part of all other commodities, especially in the imperfectly developed stages of civil society, will continue for a long time to be estimated by the former antiquated and illusory value of the measure of value. Nevertheless, one commodity infects another through their common value relation, so that their prices, expressed in gold or in silver, gradually settle down into the proportion determined by their comparative values, until finally the values of all commodities are estimated in terms of the new value of the metal that constitutes money. This process is accompanied by the continued increase in the quantity of the precious metals, an increase caused by their streaming in to replace the articles directly bartered for them at their sources of production. In proportion, therefore, as commodities in general acquire their true prices, in proportion as their values become estimated according to the fallen value of the precious metal, in the same proportion the quantity of that metal necessary for realizing those new prices is provided beforehand. A one-sided observation of the results that followed upon the discovery of fresh supplies of gold and silver led some economists in the 17th and particularly in the 18th century to the false conclusion that the prices of commodities had gone up in consequence of the increased quantity of gold and silver serving as the means of circulation. In the following, the value of gold will be taken as a given, as in fact it is at the moment when we estimate the price of a commodity. On this supposition, then, the quantity of the medium's circulation is determined by the sum of the prices that have to be realized. If now we further suppose the price of each commodity to be given, the sum of the prices clearly depends on the mass of commodities in circulation. It requires but little racking of brains to comprehend that if one quarter of wheat costs two pounds sterling, one hundred quarters will cost two hundred pounds sterling, 200 quarters, 400 pounds sterling, and so on, 
that consequently the quantity of money that changes place with the wheat one sold must increase with the quantity of that wheat if the mass of commodities remain constant the quantity of circulating money varies with the fluctuations in the prices of those commodities it increases and diminishes because the sum of the prices increases or diminishes in consequence of the change of price to produce this effect it is by no means requisite that the prices of all commodities should rise or fall simultaneously a rise or a fall in the prices of a number of leading articles is sufficient in the one case to increase in the other to diminish the sum of the prices of all commodities and therefore to put more or less money in circulation whether the change in the price correspond to an actual change of value in the commodities or whether it be the result of mere fluctuations in market prices the effect on the quantity of the medium of circulation remains the same suppose the following articles are to be sold or partially metamorphosed simultaneously in different localities say one quarter of wheat two hundred yards of linen one bible and four gallons of brandy if the price of each article be two pounds sterling and the sum of the prices to be realized be consequently eight pounds sterling it follows that eight pounds sterling in money must go into circulation if on the other hand these same articles are links in the following chain of metamorphoses one quarter of wheat to two pounds sterling to twenty yards of linen to two pounds sterling to one bible to two pounds sterling to four gallons of brandy to two pounds sterling a chain that is already well known to us in that case the two pounds sterling caused the different commodities to circulate one after the other and after realizing their prices successively and therefore the sum of those prices eight pounds sterling they come to rest at last in the pocket of the distiller the two pounds sterling thus make four moves this repeated change of place of the same pieces of money correspond to the double change in form of the commodities to their motion in opposite directions through stages of circulation and to the interlacing of the metamorphoses of different commodities footnote it is products which set it money in motion and make it circulate the velocity of its monies motion supplements its quantity when necessary it does nothing but slide from hand to hand without stopping for a moment End quote. le trasne loco citato pages 915 and 916 and footnote these antithetic and complementary phases of which the process of metamorphosis consists are gone through not simultaneously but successively time is therefore required for the completion of the series hence the velocity of the currency of money is measured by the number of moves made by a given piece of money in a given time suppose the circulation of the four articles takes a day the sum of the prices to be realized in the day is eight pounds sterling the number of moves of the two pieces of money is four and the quantity of money circulating is two pounds sterling hence for a given interval of time during the process of circulation we have the following relation the quantity of money functioning as the circulating medium is equal to the sum of the prices of the commodities divided by the number of moves made by the coins of the same denomination this law holds generally the total circulation of commodities in a given country during a given period is made up on the one hand of numerous isolated and simultaneous partial metamorphoses sales which are at the same time purchases in which each coin changes its place only once or makes only one move on the other hand of numerous distinct series of metamorphoses partly running side by side and partly coalescing with each other in each of which series each coin makes a number of moves the number being greater or less according to circumstances the total number of moves made by all the circulating coins of one denomination being given we can arrive at the average number of moves made by a single coin of that denomination or at the average velocity of the currency of money the quantity of money thrown into the circulation at the beginning of each day is of course determined 
by the sum of the prices of all the commodities circulating simultaneously side by side but once in circulation coins are so to say made responsible for one another if the one increases its velocity the other retards its own or altogether falls out of circulation for the circulation can absorb only such a quantity of gold as when multiplied by the mean number of moves made by one single coin or element is equal to the sum of the prices to be realized hence if the number of moves made by the separate pieces increase the total number of those pieces in circulation diminishes if the number of the moves diminish the total number of pieces increases since the quantity of money capable of being absorbed by the circulation is given for a given mean velocity of currency all that is necessary in order to abstract a given number of sovereigns from the circulation is to throw the same number of one pound notes into it a trick well known to all bankers just as the currency of money generally considered is but a reflex of the circulation of commodities or of the antithetical metamorphoses they undergo so too the velocity of that currency reflects the rapidity with which commodities change their forms the continued interlacing of one series of metamorphoses with another the hurried social interchange of matter the rapid disappearance of commodities from the sphere of circulation and the equally rapid substitutions of fresh ones in their places hence in the velocity of the currency we have the fluent unity of the antithetical and complementary phases the unity of the conversion of the useful aspect of commodities into their value aspect and their reconversion from the latter aspect to the former or the unity of the two processes of sale and purchase on the other hand the retardation of the currency reflects the separation of these two processes into isolated antithetical phases reflects the stagnation in the change of form and therefore in the social interchange of matter the circulation itself of course gives no clue to the origin of this stagnation it merely puts in evidence the phenomenon itself the general public who simultaneously with the retardation of the currency see money appear and disappear less frequently at the periphery of circulation naturally attribute this retardation to a quantitative deficiency in the circulating medium footnote quote, money being the common measure of buying and selling everybody who hath anything to sell and cannot procure chapman for it is presently apt to think that want of money in the kingdom or country is the cause why his goods do not go off and so want of money is the common cry which is a great mistake what do these people want who cry out for money the farmer complains he thinks that were more money in the country he should have a price for his goods then it seems money is not his want but a price for his corn and cattle which he would sell but cannot why cannot he get a price one either there is too much corn and cattle in the country so that those who come to market have need of selling as he hath and few of buying or two there wants the usual vent abroad by transportation or three the consumption fails as when men by reason of poverty do not spend so much in their houses as formerly they did wherefore it is not the increase of specific money which would at all advance the farmer's good but the removal of any of these three causes which do truly keep down the market the merchant and shopkeeper want money in the same manner that is they want a vent for the goods they deal in by reason that the markets fail a nation never thrives better than when riches are tossed from hand to hand End quote. sir dudley north discourses upon trade london sixteen ninety one pages eleven to fifteen Herrenschwanz's fanciful notions amount merely to this that the antagonism which has its origin in the nature of commodities and is reproduced in their circulation can be removed by increasing the circulating medium but if on the one hand it is a popular delusion to ascribe stagnation in production and circulation to insufficiency of the circulating medium it by no means follows on the other hand that in actual paucity of the medium in consequence 
e.g., the bungling legislative interference with the regulation of currency, may not give rise to such stagnation. End footnote. The total quantity of money functioning during a given period as the circulating medium is determined, on the one hand, by the sum of the prices of the circulating commodities, and on the other hand, by the rapidity with which the antithetical phases of the metamorphoses follow one another. On this rapidity depends what proportion of the sum of the prices can, on the average, be realized by each single coin. But the sum of the prices of the circulating commodities depends on the quantity as well as on the prices of the commodities. These three factors, however, state of prices, quantity of circulating commodities, and velocity of money currency, are all variable. Hence, the sum of the prices to be realized, and consequently the quantity of the circulating medium, depending on that sum, will vary with the numerous variations of these three factors in combination. Of these variations we shall consider those alone that have been the most important in the history of prices. While prices remain constant, the quantity of the circulating medium may increase owing to the number of circulating commodities increasing, or to the velocity of currency decreasing, or to a combination of the two. On the other hand, the quantity of the circulating medium may decrease with a decreasing number of commodities, or with an increasing rapidity of their circulation. With a general rise in the prices of commodities, the quantity of the circulating medium will remain constant, provided the number of commodities in circulation decrease proportionally to the increase in their prices, or provided the velocity of currency increase at the same rate as prices rise, the number of commodities in circulation remaining constant. The quantity of the circulating medium may decrease, owing to the number of commodities decreasing more rapidly, or to the velocity of currency rise. With a general fall in the prices of commodities, the quantity of the circulating medium will remain constant, provided the number of commodities increase proportionally to their fall in prices, or provided the velocity of currency decrease in the same proportion. The quantity of the circulating medium will increase, provided the number of commodities increase quicker, or the rapidity of circulation decrease quicker, than the prices fall. The variations of the different factors may mutually compensate each other, so that notwithstanding their continued instability, the sum of the prices to be realized and the quantity of money in circulation remain constant. Consequently, we find, especially if we take long periods into consideration, that the deviations from the average level of the quantity of money current in any country are much smaller than we should at first sight expect, apart of course from excessive perturbations periodically arising from industrial and commercial crises, or less frequently, from fluctuations in the value of money. The law that the quantity of the circulating medium is determined by the sum of the prices of the commodities circulating, and the average increasing more rapidly than the price's velocity of currency may also be stated as follows. Given the sum of the values of commodities, and the average rapidity of their metamorphoses, the quantity of precious metal current as money depends on the value of that precious metal. Footnote. Quote, there is a certain measure and proportion of money requisite to drive the trade of a nation, more or less than which would prejudice the same. Just as there is a certain proportion of farthings necessary in a small retail trade to change silver money, and to even such reckonings as cannot be adjusted with the smallest silver pieces. Now, as the proportion of the number of farthings requisite in commerce is to be taken from the number of people, the frequency of their exchanges, as also, and principally, from the value of the smallest silver pieces of money, so in like manner the proportion of money, gold and silver specie, requisite in our trade, is to be likewise taken from the frequency of commutations, and from the bigness of the payments. End quote. William Petty, A Treatise of Taxes and Contributions, London, 1667, page 17. The theory of Hume was defended against the attacks of J. Stuart and others by A. Young in his Political Arithmetic, London, 1774, in which work there is a special chapter entitled Prices Depend on Quantity of Money, 
at page 112, I have stated in Sir Critique, etc., page 149, he, Adam Smith, passes over without remark the question as to the quantity of coins in circulation, and treats money quite wrongly as a mere commodity. This statement applies only in so far as Adam Smith, ex officio, treats of money. Now and then, however, as in his criticism of the earlier systems of political economy, he takes the right view. Quote, the quantity of coin in every country is regulated by the value of the commodities which are to be circulated by it. The value of the goods evenly bought and sold in any country requires a certain quantity of money to circulate and distribute them to their proper consumers, and can give employment to no more. The channel of circulation necessarily draws to itself a sum sufficient to fill it, and never admits any more. End quote. Wealth of Nations, Book 4, Chapter 1 In like manner, ex officio, he opens his work with an apotheosis on the division of labor. Afterwards, in the last book which treats of the sources of public revenue, he occasionally repeats the denunciations of the division of labor made by his teacher, a. Ferguson. End footnote. The erroneous opinion that it is, on the contrary, prices that are determined by the quantity of the circulating medium, and that the latter depends on the quantity of the precious metals in the country. This opinion was based by those who first held it, on the absurd hypothesis that commodities are without a price, and money without a value, when they first enter into circulation, and that, once in the circulation, an aliquot part of the medley of commodities is exchanged for an aliquot part of the heap of precious metals. There are two footnotes. First footnote. That the price of each single kind of commodity forms a span of the sum of the prices of all the commodities in circulation is a self-evident proposition. But how use values, which are incommensurable with regard to each other, are to be exchanged, and mass for a total sum of gold or silver in a country, is quite incomprehensible. If we start from the notion that all commodities together form one single commodity, of which each is but an aliquot part, we get the following beautiful result. The total commodity equals x carat weight of gold. Commodity A equals an aliquot part of the total commodity equals the same aliquot part of x carat weight of gold. This is stated in all seriousness by Montesquieu. Quote, if one compares the amount of gold and silver in the world with the sum of the commodities available, it is certain that each product or commodity, taken in isolation, could be compared with a certain portion of the total amount of money. Let us suppose that there is only one product or commodity in the world or only one that can be purchased, and that it can be divided in the same way as money, a certain part of this commodity would then correspond to a part of the total amount of money. Half the total of the one would correspond to half the total of the other, etc. The determination of the prices of things always depend fundamentally on the relation between the total amount of things and the total amount of their monetary symbols. End quote. Montesquieu, Local Citato, Title 3, pages 12 and 13. As to the further development of this theory by Ricardo and his disciples, James Mill, Lord Overstone, and others, see Zur Critique, etc., pages 140 to 146, and page 150. John Stuart Mill, with his usual eclectic logic, understands how to hold at the same time the view of his father, James Mill, and the opposite view. On a comparison of the text of his compendium, Principles of Political Economy, with his preface to the first edition, in which preface he announces himself as the Adam Smith of his day, we do not know whether to admire more the simplicity of the man, or that of the public, who took him in good faith for the Adam Smith he announced himself to be although he bears about as much resemblance to Adam Smith as, say, General Williams, of Cars, to the Duke of Wellington. The original researches of Mr. J. S. Mill, which are neither extensive nor profound in the domain of political economy, will be found mustered in rank and file in his little work, Some Unsettled Questions of Political Economy, which appeared in 1844. 
Locke asserts point-blank the connection between the absence of value in gold and silver and the determination of their values by quantity alone. Quote, Mankind having consented to put an imaginary value upon gold and silver, the intrinsic value regarded in these metals is nothing but the quantity. End quote. Some Considerations, etc., 1691, Works Edition, 1777, Volume 2, page 15. End footnote. Second footnote. It lies, of course, entirely beyond my purpose to take into consideration such details as the seigneurage on minting. I will, however, cite for the benefit of the romantic sycophant Adam Muller, who admires the generous liberality with which the English government coins gratuitously, the following opinion of Sir Dudley North. Quote, Silver and gold, like other commodities, have their ebbings and flowings. Upon the arrival of quantities from Spain, it is carried into the tower and coined. Not long after, there will come a demand for bullion to be exported again. If there is none, but all happens to be in coin, what then? Melt it down again. There is no loss in it, for the coining costs the owner nothing. Thus the nation has been abused and made to pay for the twisting of straw for asses to eat. If the merchant were made to pay the price of the coinage, he would not have sent his silver to the tower without consideration, and coined money would always keep a value above uncoined silver. End quote. North, Loco Citato, page 18. North was himself one of the foremost merchants in the reign of Charles II. End footnote. End of chapter 3, section 2b of Capital, volume 1.